It's so great to see so many people have joined us here tonight, especially in the building. Uh, it's great to be back here. And if you're joining, watching at home or elsewhere online, it's so lovely that you've joined us as well. Uh, we've been gathered together tonight here in the building and wherever you are in the world uh, to do a couple of things to, uh, to hear, especially we've been gathered to hear from the living God. Uh, later, we'll, be, we'll continue our sermon series in the book of Philippians. And Howard Spencer, a member of the congregation, will preach to us. And he, he will preach from these verses. Paul says in Philippians that he has learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I'm sure this week all sorts of situations have been experienced in this room and wherever you are. Uh, all of us have probably faced maybe need or, or plenty and many of us will want to know what is the secret of being content? Well, I can tell you as a bit of a spoiler that it has everything to do with knowing who God is and more than that, knowing him personally. We're going to start by singing uh, a song that's about well, more than contentment but about joy joy in knowing who God is and what he has done for us. Uh, if you're at home, you can sing uh, loudly. Uh, here in the building, I'm afraid we'll have to hum along or just mouth the words. But either way, let's lift up our hearts to the Lord as we sing. i 
I'm Lauren and I'm on the staff team here at STAG and um, it's great to welcome you here virtually and those of you in the church building um, and especially to you if you're new here, um, it's great to have you join us. Um, if you are new, um, there are a few things for you to know uh, to get to know church family here better. Um, first, um, please go to stag.org forward slash new and let us know who you are. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and a member of staff will be in touch to answer any questions you have or let you know more about church life here. Um, second, you can join us virtually for a coffee after the service by going to stag.org uh, forward slash after church coffee. Um, you do have to make your own coffee, but you will get to know a small group of the church family in a breakout group. Um, and lastly, you can now join us in the building, and um, there are loads here today, and we'd love to see you face to face. Um, so if you would like to come, please sign up at stag.org forward slash attend. Um, and we'd love to see more of the regular church family here over the coming weeks as well. So please do sign up. Um, also to bring to your attention, we have another central teaching meeting coming up. Um, so a week on Wednesday, on the 5th of August. Um, Dane Ortland is going to join us on Zoom. Uh, he's recently written a book called Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. Um, I've just started it and it's been so good to warm my heart to Christ's love and care for his people. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more from him. Um, do join um, on the 5th of August at 8pm on Zoom. We're now going to hear from some of our mission partners, Chris and Ting Prekop, who are now in Singapore, um, but they've recently met with James Steer online to fill us in on how they've been getting on and how we can be praying for them. Hi, Chris and Ting. It's really great to have you with us and to be able to catch up a little uh, with you. Um, for those of us who have been uh, maybe new to the, particularly the 5 p.m. service, can you remind us a little bit of uh, who you are? What's your link with St Andrew the Great? What are you doing in Singapore at the moment? Yep. So uh, I'm Chris. This is Ting, and uh, we were both uh, actually undergraduate students at uh, St Andrew the Great. Uh, so I was there from 2004 to 2007, and Ting was there from 2008 to 2011. And uh, I then stayed on for another three years uh, to work for uh, St Andrew the Great, first as a church assistant and then for two years as a student worker. And depending on which one of us uh, you talk to, you'll get a slightly different story about whether or not we met uh, during that one year of overlap. Uh, and I uh, then, we're in uh, Singapore, uh, Ting's working in uh, research and I'm one of the pastors at the Crossing Church, um, sort of uh, normal sort of pastoral responsibilities there, preaching, uh, training, uh, Bible study leaders, and so on. Now, as well as working at the Crossing, I know you've also got um, some links with uh, the church in Myanmar. Can you tell us a bit about uh, about that? How did, how did that come about? What, what's your involvement? Yeah, so one of the things we've hoped for a long time as a church is that we would uh, be able to be a blessing to the wider uh, Southeast Asian uh, region. And uh, that was, uh, didn't happen immediately. So we sort of just church planted uh, 10 years ago, took a little time just to establish ourselves but then opportunities started to emerge as we, as we met people from overseas, as we uh, met people who were working in sort of missionary uh, contexts overseas, including, including you uh, at one point. And uh, so, yeah, just as those opportunities opened up um, and uh, I was, we met particularly a group that was doing training with uh, pastors, uh, so training pastors to read and teach the Bible. And they were doing work in several countries in the region and invited uh, me to come along and observe one of those, and uh, my, it so happened that uh, I was free for the trip to Myanmar. I didn't really know much about Myanmar before that, uh, but I uh, went along, 
And that was about three and a half years ago now. And so I've been going back uh, twice a year since, uh, just for about a week at a time. And we're just uh, still at very early stages. Uh, me and Mars uh, uh, got a lot of uh, opportunities, but a lot of challenges for the gospel. And so a lot of our time is spent getting to know the pastors uh, that we're hoping to train, uh, uh, teaching them. And then we're working with a few others, particularly one very encouraging guy who's uh, planted a little mission center in a Buddhist village. And mm. uh, he's training a convert uh, to be a pastor in that church. And they're doing fantastic work in, in difficult circumstances, reaching out there. So we try and partner him a bit uh, and, uh, and, and others who are doing similar work. So it's varied. Uh, it's quite new, um, but uh, ex- exciting gospel opportunities. Mm. And kind of what are the impacts of kind of, I guess, COVID and lockdown be for some of that? Have you still been able to keep in contact with some of the pastors and encourage yeah. them? So already this year, one trip has not been able to go ahead in uh, May, and it seems very likely that uh, the trip in November won't be able to go ahead either. So that's been sad. I think we felt like we were gathering some momentum with this particular group we were training, and it's sad not to be able to keep that on. Um, we've been trying to extend us a little bit by email, um, but one, one of the great things I think is it's, it's made me pray uh, more uh, for them, realizing them actually not being able to be there has just uh, made me want to pray for more, which is a great uh, thing for me personally to learn. Uh, so yeah, it, it's a bit of a bit of an unknown, bit of an uncertain at the moment, uh, what it will look like to move forward uh, partnering them. But we've, we're, we've seen the Lord be kind in lots of unexpected ways in the last few uh, months, and we're confident that he has good plans and purposes for uh, the work in Myanmar and the rest of Southeast Asia as well. And uh, finally, how can we be praying for you both, I guess, personally, uh, but also maybe for that some of that training work in Myanmar as well? Yeah, so personally, we are uh, expecting a daughter in uh, end of September, beginning of October. So you can be praying for us um, as we prepare for the life change, uh, especially as both sets of parents are in the UK. So uh, they won't be able to visit probably. Um, so we'll be uh, trusting that our church family will be taking uh, good care of us and stepping up. Um, uh, and also for our personal evangelism as well, uh, that as I go into maternity leave, that we would uh, stay in contact with my non-costume colleagues. Um, those are our kind of main points of contact here in, um, in Singapore as, uh, as we reach out with the gospel. For Myanmar, I think... Um... You just pray for wisdom in the midst of the uncertainty, knowing what it will look like to resume uh, training at the, an appropriate time. One of the things we did the first time this year was to get a young guy who we hoped might be a, one of our ministry trainees. He, we flew him over for a week just to see the church, see if he'd like to explore that. And we'd like to do that sort of thing. Uh, that, that didn't work out with him, but we'd like to do that sort of thing more often, bring sort of pastors or potential trainees to Singapore for a week. Uh, we're planning that tentatively for April. And the next year, and uh, that, that will hopefully include one or two guys from Myanmar just to uh, have the relationship working both ways, them coming here and us going uh, there. So we'd love for that to go ahead. I'd love for wisdom to know what it will look like to resume uh, my trips to uh, Myanmar. And uh, yeah, and I think just like I said earlier, keep, keep praying to, to believe that it's the, the Lord that builds the house and that actually our labors without him are in vain anyway. And so to be very content at this time to keep praying for the work uh, there. Mm. Great. Oh, that's such an encouragement to hear that. And we'll certainly be praying uh, for those things for you and for the work uh, in Myanmar as well. Thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, today. It's been really good to see you and to be able to catch up and hear a little bit uh, of your ministry and work for the Lord in uh, Asia. Thank you. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you. We're going to pray together now for the Precops. And Ugo, a member of our church family, is going to lead us. Let's pray. As we approach our holy, heavenly Father, who sees and knows all our hearts, um, let's begin with a prayer of confession, um, recognizing how we've often failed to live in a way that pleases him, even recently. So please join me with the words uh, in the service sheet or on coming up on the screen. Lord, we acknowledge our sin and the guilt of our world. We have indeed sinned against you. For the sake of your name, do not reject us. Remember your promises to us in Jesus our Savior and forgive us our sin. 
for his name's sake. Amen. What an encouragement to keep looking to Christ. As in scripture, we're reminded that in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Let's continue to pray. Our gracious Father, may all glory and honor be to you, the only sovereign God. Every day, circumstances of our lives, not least in these difficult and uncertain times, call and remind us to seek for your kingdom and rule to come, and for your will to be done in this world as it is in heaven. May this truly be our yearning. We thank you that we are gradually able to gather more here in this building, as well as online, to worship and praise your name, to bring our petitions to you, and to listen to your word explained and applied to us. We pray for our brother and sister, Chris and Ting Prekop. Thank you for calling them to know and serve you as a couple, and for the ways you have blessed and sustained them in ministry at the Crossing Church in Singapore. We praise you for their commitment to building up your people in that church family, and to keep reaching out with the gospel to Ting's non-Christian colleagues, as well as to the wider community around the ch their church. Please may their work be bearing much fruit for the honor of your name. We're encouraged by this vision the Crossing Church has to serve and train believers and church leaders across the Southeast Asia region. We thank you for the links and relationships that have been built with this particular Christian group in Myanmar, who are part of a tiny Christian minority in a significant, significantly Buddhist population. We pray that Chris's trips to visit them might be able to resume soon and that this encouraging gospel partnership will continue to be strengthened. We pray too for the safe arrival of Chris and Ting's daughter in about a couple of months time. We ask that in your goodness, they will be prepared and provided with all they need for this family life change and that they would know the joy and blessing of parenting in Christ. Father, in a time when many of members of our church family, as well as others we know, would have been participating in various summer camps, we pray for the Christian families, teenagers, and volunteers who've been affected, that they would find other valuable, valuable and spiritually enriching ways to spend their summer. Thank you that a number of camps and ventures are hosting alternative online events. We ask that these would be helpful in strengthening the faith of Christian youngsters and drawing non-believing ones to Christ. Lord, we pray for governments and leaders across the world making even day-to-day -day decisions about how to respond to the current pandemic. We pray for your mercy and compassion on them with all the heightened pressures. Please, would you cause them to act with wisdom and with the responsibility they carry as your stewards for the welfare of the nations they lead especially in countries that are seeing rising numbers of people infected and those with the least amount of adequate health care and economic resources. And by your grace, Lord, we pray that across this country, more people will be moved to find the mercy, forgiveness, and gift of true life in Christ that overcomes death while there is still time. Lord, of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft the love of your name in our hearts, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all that is good, and by your great mercy, keep us in this condition, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing together again of God's great love shown to us in Jesus. So let's stand uh, to sing or hum. <laughs> Stars the ocean, loving kindness. 
Our church apprentices is going to read our Bible reading to us, so if you could grab a Bible in hand and turn to Philippians, and then after that, Howard Spencer, a member of our congregation, is going to preach it to us. Today's reading is from Philippians chapter 4, verse 10 to 23. Before we, pray, we read, let's pray. Our Father, we praise you that your word is more to be valued than much fine gold and sweeter than honey from the honeycomb. Would that be our experience this evening as your word is read and taught? Please unite us and build us up so that as the church of Christ, we may be ready to do every good work. In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians chapter 4, starting from verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renew your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only, 
for even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Great, greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Well, good evening, everybody, uh, and may I add my welcome to those of James and the others, uh, whether you're here tonight. It's lovely to see some real people after so long, and or whether you are uh, out there in cyberspace somewhere watching at home. Uh, we always love to spend some time uh, here at Stag in the Bible at every service. Uh, if you're looking in, tuning in as one of those people who at this time of year is moving to Cambridge uh, or, or just in thinking about Christian things, we always love to spend time in the Bible uh, because we believe it's the place above all where God speaks to us in a clear and objective way so that we may know of his love, we may know about the Lord Jesus, we know how we may know our God and be safe forever. And so here we are, if you're joining us for the first time or if you've been away somewhere and I can bring you back up to speed, we are just finishing a series in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, which he founded in the sense that he preached the gospel there uh, some years before, and he's had a lovely relationship with them ever since. Uh, and um, it's, it's written by Paul, it's written to the church in Philippi, and Paul himself is currently in a rather strange situation. He's banged up in custody, probably in Rome, but in a Roman headquarters somewhere. And he's uh, going to be tried on a capital charge simply because he's been preaching the good news around the empire about the Lord Jesus Christ and how we can know God. Uh, and he's awaiting uh, that verdict and he writes to his friends in Philippi. And the fact that he is banged up in custody makes it all the more remarkable that this, this letter is characterised by joy. It is shot through with joy. If you buy a popular book to help you understand this uh, particular part of the Bible, I will guarantee it has joy somewhere in the title. It's the characteristic of this marvellous letter. And uh, Paul is coming to the end of this letter. He's going to close off, as it were, tonight. He's twice said finally, but now he really is going to finish. And to help us navigate through uh, this last section of the letter, uh, we're going to look at two blank checks and a farewell bonus. Two blank checks and a farewell bonus. Uh, and if you worry about these things, by the way, uh, the first point is going to take the great majority of our time. So uh, don't get too worried. You won't get your dinner tonight. First of all, then, blank check number one. Here we go. Uh, my wife uh, was given by a well-meaning relative uh, an apron. Uh, on which were beautifully embroidered the words, I can do all things. Now, if you know Mary well, as uh, a number of you do, you'll realise that's nothing more than a, a plain statement of fact. But the apron didn't just say, I can do all things. It said, I can do all things, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. And here's the first of Paul's apparent blank checks in this letter. Here it comes up on the screen. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Uh, some of you are reading in your own Bibles at home. Some of you are following in a Bible in church. So you may have slightly different versions of this verse, which all come down to the same thing. I've put up the, uh, the version that is the most literal and probably the version that many of you have learned in the past. I can do all things 
in him who strengthens me. And it's a wonderful statement, isn't it? A wonderful uh, implicit promise to us as, as Christian people. What does it mean? We can win that Olympic gold medal we'd set our heart on. Uh, we can get those five A stars at A level so that we get into the university that we want. What's Paul saying when he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me? This statement, uh, it's not just aprons, and I should point out, by the way, that a, a fetching modesty and a respect for scripture means that Mary's never actually worn the apron. Uh, but that, this, 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 this verse has been a mainstay, a staple, hasn't it, of the Christian sort of knick-knack industry over the years. It's been a, a rich milch cow for them. And yet it's so often misunderstood. And to see how to understand this, uh, this marvelous statement properly, let's see how Paul finds his way there. So we pick up at, at verse 10, if you're following in your own Bible, where Paul says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. I think I'd want to put that slightly differently. Uh, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that yet again, after all this time, you are still showing your concern for me and it's blossoming once more. Uh, I know, he says, Paul, that you were always concerned and you didn't always have the opportunity to show it, but that opportunity has come round again and I'm very grateful. What we discover is that as we come to the end of this letter, it's not just a, an essay in Christian encouragement to egg on the Philippians in their walk with the Lord, uh, but it's actually a thank you note as well. But it's not like those thank you notes you had to write after Christmas as a kid. You remember your mother locked you in your bedroom and said there's no more chocolate until you've written three letters. So, dear Aunt Emily, uh, thank you so much for the exciting grey socks you sent me. They're just what I always wanted, not. Um, this is no grudging, reluctant thank you note. Uh, this is an expression, in fact, of a rich relationship with old friends who he holds very dear. But, Paul says, I'm not actually saying thank you uh, when I'm thinking from the point of view of my needs. Uh, verse 11. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Uh, I wonder what you ran out of during lockdown. What was that vital thing which uh, evaporated or expired in, in your household? It was inner tubes with us. I punctured twice in the first few days of lockdown, went to the shed to put things right, uh, and found not only had I exhausted my supply of fresh inner tubes, but I'd used up all my puncture patches. Do you know how much joy it can bring when you eventually find an internet supplier who can send you four inner tubes and a, set, and a puncture outfit? But Paul isn't writing from that point of view. He's not saying, do you know, I'm banged up in prison. I have to provide for my own needs. I didn't know where the next meal was coming from. And whew, the postman brought your letter with the uh, postal order in it. Don't have postal orders these days, do you? But anyway, you know what I mean. No, Paul is going to tell us in a moment just why he's so happy about this gift that the Philippians have sent. But first of all, he wants to make another point along the way. Verse 11 again. I'm not saying this, because, not saying uh, I'm glad for the gift because of my needs, because actually I've learned to be content in whatever situation I am. Uh, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. And how has he found the secret? How has he found the secret of coping with whatever difficulties, whatever hardships, whatever disappointments life might throw at him? Verse 13, here comes that blank check. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. I think I'd want, to, I'd want to, to say, I can cope with anything. That's the sense of what Paul's saying. In him who strengthens me. 
So what's the thing in your life right now that brings you hardship or pain or need? What is it for you? How are you coping? How can you and I cope when hardship, pain, loss, whatever it may be, strikes in your life or mine? But Paul says, I can cope with anything in him who strengthens me. When Paul says, him who strengthens me, he means, of course, the Lord Jesus. And this expression, in Jesus, in Christ, in him, is an expression Paul loves to use to express the richness, the depth, the closeness of the Christian's relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that relationship means more than anything else to Paul. It's the heart, it's the focus of his own life. And this letter has shown us that richly, hasn't it? Do you remember how he said, I count all things as loss. Why? For the surpassing worth of knowing, not believing in, not serving, but knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. He says, in fact, he has suffered the loss of all things. This man who was once the, one of the movers and shakers of his generation, of his society, now disgraced, persecuted by his own countrymen because of preaching the gospel, banged up in a Roman jail on a capital charge. And yet he says... I count all things as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing, knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. And as he puts it, being found in him. Being made right with God, not because of what he, Paul, has done, but because of what he knows Jesus has done for him. He's seen the love of Jesus in him going to the cross for Paul, for the Philippians, for sinners everywhere, for you and me, if we will turn to him. He knows the glory of Jesus, risen from the dead, reigning at God's right hand, one day for all creation to bow before him in adoration. And he knows that he, Paul, belongs securely to this Jesus, who is Lord of all and the Saviour of those who trust in him. And that is why he can say, do you remember early on in the letter? He says, as he waits the verdict of his capital charge, he says, I toss up. Do I want to live? Do I want to die? Well, actually, I prefer to die. Because that's far better I go to be with the Lord Jesus who saved me and whom I love and who has promised to keep me safe forever. But actually I think I'm probably going to stay around because I can still be a bit of use to other people for the time being. But he can, he can say that's his preference because he has a clear sight of Jesus and that's what drives his life. And that's why he can say in our blank check number one, I can do all things. I can cope with whatever life throws at me in him who strengthens me. Just like the athlete who's happy to go through hard training or the soldier who has to go through all sorts of privations, Paul says, because I have a goal which is worthwhile, because I've had a glimpse of glory, because I've got a clear sight of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done for me, then I can cope with whatever this life throws at me. So what can we do? Well, we too can look afresh to Jesus. I think so often if we're Christians, we, we beat ourselves up when we're feeling spiritually low. We think, what can we do? What can we do? Perhaps I need to pray more, perhaps I need to serve more, perhaps I need to do this, do that. Stand back and look afresh at Jesus. That's where it all begins. The gospel 
is a religion of grace. God gives to us before we ever give back, as it were, to him. And so when we're spiritually low, when we're spiritually stale, when we are struggling under the pressures of life, what do we do? We look afresh at Jesus. And if we want to stay going on with the Lord, running well as Christians, we want to keep looking at him. The most consistent and the most contented Christian I ever knew was a man who taught me at college and I remained friends with him, a treasured friendship for 30 years afterwards until at a very great age he went to glory. And I once plucked up the courage to ask him what he did in his quiet times. And he told me that every year he read the New Testament in Greek uh, through once. He read the Old Testament in Hebrew over every two years. But he said, the thing that I put the most store on is the fact that I'm sure to read something from the Gospels every day. Something that brings me face to face with the Lord Jesus himself. And that was the mainspring, the wellspring of his life. And it was that clear vision of Jesus that drove Paul on to. And it's that clear vision of Jesus that will lead us on, give us strength, and enable us, like Paul, to cope, in fact, with whatever life may throw at us. Well, that's our first point, that often misunderstood, that apparent blank check, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Yes, indeed, it is wonderful. We can cope with all things, whatever happens, if we fix our eyes on Jesus. Blank check number two, moving on. Verse 19, you'll find it. Paul says now to his Philippian friends, my God will supply your every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Uh, do you want some of that? Uh, I think I do. I'm very glad to have all my needs met. What exactly is Paul saying? It's another marvellous blank check to the Christian. But we have to understand, if you like, how to cash it. We have to understand again how Paul leads into what is a promise to the Philippians, but a promise to all who know and love the Lord Jesus. So we're picking up, you remember Paul broke off, he said, I rejoice greatly to receive uh, the gift that you sent. Uh, and then he broke off to explain why it wasn't the gift uh, itself that, that, that he uh, was concerned about. And now he's picking up his thread again. He says, verse 14, it was a lovely thing you did to share in my troubles. And he recalls fondly the times that they have helped him in the past. There's this lovely ongoing uh, partnership with the Philippians. We, we start off early in the, in the book. He says, uh, do you know I thank God every time I remember you? Every time I think about you, I thank God because I'm so, uh, so grateful for your partnership in the gospel ever since we first knew each other. And so he recalls times that they've helped him in the past, verses 15 and 16. As you Philippians yourselves know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, it's quite a pompous way of putting it, isn't it? When I sat at, set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. And Paul recalls with fondness and with gratitude the many times and many ways in which his friends in Philippi have helped him. But then he says, please don't think it's your money I'm after. Verse 17, not that I desire your gifts. What I, what I desire, he says, is that more be credited to your account. What on earth is he talking about? He's suddenly going into the language of commerce. He's talking about interest being added to a bank account. Well, uh, it becomes clear as we read on. I have received full payment, he says, verse 18, 
Uh, that's not a very helpful translation. He's using, I think, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, the language that you would use when you stamped a receipt to say that uh, you, you received whatever had been sent to you. And he's saying, uh, I've received everything that you sent, that your messenger Epaphroditus sent, um, uh, and I have now more than enough. In fact, I'm amply supplied now that uh, Epaphroditus, one of your, your, your members, has sent those gifts. And then he says... They're a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. He's gone from the slightly tongue-in-cheek language of commerce to the language of worship and devotion. And Paul's saying, what I'm so pleased about is not so much that I've received a gift from you, but what this gift tells me about how you are. Because he sees this gift, not primarily as something that's sent to him, but as a token of devotion to God. Uh, I had the unfortunate experience some years ago of being um, shut up in ITU at uh, a hospital down the road. And there was I lying with tubes coming out of everywhere. Uh, and every now and then the staff would look at these banks of screens at the side of the bed. Uh, and they would look for signs that... Uh, my health is uh, beginning to return, that I'm coming on okay. And Paul is saying, you know, these gifts that you sent me, they're like those screens in the ITU. I can see that you're doing well. They're an indicator of your spiritual health. They are telling me that you're still with the program. They are telling me that you, you, like me, are still looking to Jesus, rejoicing in him. You're on board with the gospel project. You're in good shape. And because of that, because he knows they are still looking to the Lord and trusting him, he can say, and I know that my God, because he's your God too, will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Do you remember Jesus teaching uh, in the Sermon on the Mount and saying that if you seek first the kingdom of God, if that is the big aim and goal and center and focus of your life, he says you don't have to worry about the everyday material needs of life because your heavenly Father knows you need them and he'll make sure you have them. And Paul is simply echoing the promise of the Lord Jesus that those who seek first God's kingdom do not need to worry about lack. Of course, God sees our needs and we as devoted Christians will see our needs perhaps rather differently from the way the world sees their needs. But we know that God can and will supply all that we need to continue walking with him serving him, learning from him, growing in him, and being kept safe in him until the day we see him in glory. If at the heart of our vision is the Lord Jesus leading us on. So two blank checks to the Christian who is looking to Jesus. First of all, we will be given the strength to cope with whatever life will throw at us, and who knows what that may be. Second, we know that our God, Paul's God, will meet our every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus from that bottomless pit of resources that he controls. And so Paul signs off to the Philippians our final point, and here we get the uh, farewell bonus. He says, greet all God's people in Christ Jesus, verse 21. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings. Now here comes the big one. Especially those of Caesar's household. Here is Paul, banged up in a Roman prison, for preaching the gospel. And he says, even here in Caesar's household, there are Christians. 
Now, Caesar's household doesn't mean Caesar's family or the, the butler and the scullery maid. It means the sort of apparatus of the, the empire, all the officials, administrators, and, and so on, who are running the show for Caesar. But Paul says, even here, we presume he's in Rome, although it, it doesn't matter where he is, that among the people who are running what looks like the system that's against us, this great world empire, this great world system, even here, people are turning to Christ, trusting in him, and sharing our faith. What do we learn from that? Well, we've seen how Paul and his Philippian friends, and doubtless many other of their contemporaries who trust in Christ, are fresh in their faith in the Lord Jesus We've seen how they are relying on him, how they count all things but loss for the surpassing worth of knowing him. And therefore they're willing to do whatever it takes to suffer whatever is necessary for the spread of the gospel. And when Christians are functioning like that, things happen. Nowhere is immune to that gospel. Can you imagine... Um, I'll be a little bit naughty. Dominic Cummings being converted. Or anyone else who's involved in the apparatus of state. Well, Philippians gives us hope that even at the heart of the world system, even those people who we may think at the moment might be running a system we don't greatly approve of, can be converted when we are faithful to Jesus and faithful to the gospel. So what are we going to take away, not just from tonight, but from this letter? We see a document which is shot through with joy. And it's shot through with joy because the man who's writing it and the people to whom he's writing know and love Jesus Christ. They don't just know and love him, but they see him clearly day by day. And that is the mainspring. It's the dynamo at the heart of their lives. That's what keeps them going. That's what makes them get out of bed every morning, fresh and ready to serve. That's what gives them resilience in whatever life throws at them. So let's take away from this epistle of joy uh, the one lesson that lies at the heart of it, that we look to Jesus and Jesus constantly gives back to us as we do so refreshes us in our faith and makes us effective in this world for him. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this epistle of joy and we thank you that the heart and focus of it is the sight, the clear sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who died for us, he who reigns in glory, he who works on our behalf, and he whom we long to meet. Dear Lord, would you please keep us looking afresh to him, that he might refresh us in our spirits, and we might be all you would have us to be, for your glory's sake. Amen. Our final hymn is a classic expression of trust in that promise that as we continue looking to Jesus again and again and again, that in all the situations of our life, we'll be able to not just keep going, but even to say, it is well, it is well with my soul.
As we end our time together tonight in the building, we will say a final prayer to ask God to do those things that he has promised to do in this passage. Let's pray. Our Father, we have been um, surprised and surprised again this year in all the circumstances that, uh, have, have, that we found ourselves in. There's been so much uncertainty, but we pray that you would remind us of the certainty that we have in Jesus Christ, who's the same yesterday, today and forever. We pray that we would continue to look at him and to him. As we've just sung, that we would uh, wait for his return. Know that the sky, not the grave, is our goal. Father, we pray that you would provide for all of our needs point to the riches of your glory in Christ Jesus. We pray that we would know the sufficiency of Jesus in and for every circumstance in our life and that we give you thanks and know a full uh, overflowing joy through that. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you uh, next week or on After Church Coffee. Father